Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular meeting of the City Council, including the Library and Observatory Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. Begin at 1 o'clock today, March 16th, and if you would please stand, and we'll have Gabe Cotting, Director of Marketing, do the pledge. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Gabe. Madam Clerk, would you like to do the roll call, please? Certainly. Council Member Mulatto? Present. Council Member Marker? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Downs? Here. Mayor Kite? Here. Thank you. Let's move on to the next item, which has to do with non-agenda public comments, and the city clerk will take care of this. Of, of course. So now is the time, if anyone wants to speak on matters that are not on the agenda, now would be the time to do so. I'll start with the speaker cards I have. Keith Young. Mr. Mayor, if I may, while Keith is uh, coming up, Keith, come on up, up to the uh, microphone. So uh, at our last council meeting, we appointed Keith to be our uh, appointee on the airport commissioner, or on the airport commission, the Palm Springs Airport Commission. Uh, Keith was traveling. He was on an airplane that day, and unfortunately, he couldn't be with us, but he's here now. Uh, I do want to just quickly review a little bit of uh, Keith's uh, educational background. Uh, so Keith is a uh, Bachelor of Arts degree from um, magna cum laude and uh, with honors from Central Methodist University. His, uh, his Master of Arts degree is from the University of New South Wales in Australia. He is a Doctor of Medicine from Johns Hopkins University. He holds uh, professional institute uh, uh, accreditations from the University of Toronto, University of Chicago, the, and Oxford University. And sometime in there, uh, I guess before medical school, he found time to uh, serve as uh, the uh, Government Affairs Director to the Missouri's lieutenant governor. So I look at that educational resume, and frankly, I wonder what in the world I've been doing with my time. But Keith, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here today. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kite, Mayor Pro Tem Downs, and council members. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to appear before you today, and I'm deeply appreciative of the honor to serve our city on the airport commission. I'm a 20-plus year resident of Rancho Mirage, and as with all of you, delight immensely in all that this city and valley has to offer to each of us. Certainly, the airport is a critical part of that infrastructure. I think it's an incredibly uh, interesting time to be involved in thinking about the future of the airport. As many of you may know, uh, it is embarking on a new strategic planning process. Uh, there is a rollout of new concessions, both uh, retail and dining and indeed just planning for the next couple of decades of uh, travel needs for the city's residents and tourists alike. So I'm delighted to be able to have uh, a chance to offer input on that. Uh, to all the council members, I welcome the chance to work with you. I uh, would certainly welcome the chance to have calls or meet with you to better understand your ideas or concerns, uh, both now and in the future. So again, I thank you for the privilege of serving our community and uh, look forward to serving alongside you in this role. Thank you. We look forward to working with you, and it should be a busy time for you. The International Airport is uh, busy, busy. It is indeed. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Welcome. Next speaker is Wally Melendez. Uh, good afternoon, um, City Council, Administration, Rancho Mirage. Um, <clears throat> a, somebody was asking me about the configuration. A lot of, a lot of people don't understand um, the new cars that, are, that, are, that are, will be coming out. People, I hear people say, hydrogen cars. There's no such thing as hydrogen cars. It's, it's fuel cell electric cars, or you can say vehicles. 
FCEVs, that's what they're called, FCEVs. To get a good idea of what that is, go to a, a, a website that the U.S. Department of Energy has. This website is, if you have a pencil and paper, please write it down. <clears throat> it's AFDC, Alternative Fuels Data Center, dot energy dot gov, G -O -V. And then at the heading, choose mm, fuels and vehicles. And then click on hydrogen. And when you do that, you will get a picture of a configuration of a configuration, different automobile companies may have different configurations, but this is a good basic type. You're gonna get a picture, it's gonna be kind of blurred, so tap on that picture and it's gonna be clear and you can enlarge it with your finger like you regularly do with your, with your devices. AFDC.energy.gov, a website of the U.S. Department of the U.S. And, uh, Department of Energy. <clears throat> uh, and a lot of people are, are saying, well, that's so expensive. We're not even talking about dollars and cents. We're talking about edu education, educating people on what it is. I just talked to my good friend here, and, and he's still confused. He was telling me that they were going to burn on gasoline engines, hydrogen, and some other kind of gas. That's a different thing altogether. So, so we need, as the people, we uns, we need to understand the scientific stuff so we can clean our air. All you gotta do is walk down the highway and you can smell the pollution coming out of the cars as they're racing down the street. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was the last speaker card. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak? Items not on the agenda. Go ahead and come up and please state your name. Good afternoon. My name is Christy Austin and I am here uh, to basically represent the Rancho Mirage Women's Club. I want to publicly thank the mayor, Mayor Pearl Tam and the um, councilman and uh, coming to our event last week, I really appreciate your support in, um, in one of the city arms for um, Ranch Mirage Women's Club. And just I'm grateful that we have your support and looking forward to the continuation of this partnership and uh, support of each other. So just a great, grateful thank you. Thanks for being here. They did a great job. It was a great event. And... Uh, I think the chamber really outdid themselves. So send a positive message back to your board. Thank you. So this is the Ranch Mirage Women's Club. I am also part of the chamber as the ambassador president, but I'm wearing a different hat today. Okay. <laughs> I'm, with, I'm wearing the Ranch Mirage Women's hat um, uh, as the event chair. So again, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak but did not submit a speaker card? That was the last speaker. Thank you. We'll now move on to council comments. And we'll begin with uh, asking uh, Mayor Pro Tem Downs if he has any comments. I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So today uh, I'd like to speak in support of the Children's Discovery Museum of the Desert. It's a remarkable cultural resource for all of us. It provides... Um, enrichment and intellectual stimulation for our kids and through our kids, their parents and their grandparents. And when it reopens, uh, there'll be 40 new exhibits. There'll be a, a section devoted to uh, engineering and science. Uh, it will be a certified autism center with trained staff plus a low sensory room and sensory services. Uh, it will again become part of the reason why uh, Ranch Mirage is a remarkable travel destination for all of us, including families. And it's important for our community uh, to know uh, that, uh, that when the museum reopens, it will do so with a lot of help from the city of Rancho Mirage. 
Uh, and just a reminder as to the financial commitment that this city has made to the museum uh, during uh, 2022, uh, we did a $150,000 matching grant from the city. The city also matched a $100,000 grant from Visit Greater Palm Springs. So that resulted in $250,000 from the city, but a total of $500,000 when considering the matching grants. So I'm very hopeful and I encourage the public and the desert donor community to strongly support the museum and to help reopen this vital uh, resource as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Steve. It was an excellent presentation. As mayor, I'm overwhelmingly in favor of, the, of your interest and provide funding for the much needed facility. It will really be great when this is finished and we're utilizing them uh, as the, probably the best child facility in the Valley. So thanks, Steve. We appreciate your comments. Okay, we'll go back to uh, council comments and we have a request. Let's see. No, let's see. Ted, Ted Weil, do you have a comment? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to uh, reference back to the uh, Rammies uh, that uh, took place uh, several weeks ago. It was just a fantastic event. And I'll start off with the uh, film uh, that was done as kind of a wrap-up to the Rammies. So if you would uh, play Small that business course. really is the heartbeat of America. And so bringing these folks together, giving a pat on the back really means everything. Welcome to the 2023 Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce Rammy Awards. It's such a great time to lift up, recognize, honor, and thank our local business community. Hosted at the Omni Rancho Las Palmas and Rancho Mirage, this annual event celebrates outstanding local businesses, nonprofits, and community leaders. Some of the awards include Nonprofit of the Year, Small Business of the Year, Rising Star Award, and Distinguished Citizen of the Year. Whether a small startup or a longtime staple in the community, this year's Rammy Award winners are both honored to be recognized and for the support from the Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce. Chamber is incredible. We are so, so blessed to be a part of this community in Rancho Mirage. They support us. They give us the necessary resources to succeed. The Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce is so special and it really has to do with the relationships that they build. And it's just phenomenal like across Coachella Valley. It's not just Rancho Mirage. Their reach is just fantastic. And after the final award was presented, the Chamber of Commerce aims at continuing inspiring the Rancho Mirage community, one business and one Ramy award at a time. It's so important to the Rancho Mirage community to have this awards program to really lift up and recognize our own local businesses. We're looking to grow this event year over year to make sure we're bringing the business community together. You can learn more at ranchomiragechamber.org. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the chamber is really fabulous, and uh, it's the Elmer's glue for our businesses throughout uh, Rancho Mirage, as well as the Valley. It is the single most outstanding networking organization that I know. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being able to refer a number of businesses and specifically nonprofits uh, to the chamber who have taken advantage of the contacts and uh, have grown as a result of it. So I would encourage you to attend some of their meetings, some of their lunches, and you'll find that you too will benefit. Uh, for me, uh, one of the outstanding uh, uh, parts of the evening was my uh, award to Dana Hobart uh, for his years of service on the City Council. Uh, Dana is uh, an icon as far as I'm concerned, and his contributions to the City Council over the years have been immeasurable. So again, Dana, we thank you very much for your years of service. I also want to mention that one other thing that uh, we will touch on briefly uh, during the consent 
portion of our agenda tonight is the number of meetings that have taken place during the course of the year by our many commissions. Keeping in mind that these commissions are all voluntary individuals that are giving their time. And these include the Architectural Review Board, uh, the Emergency Preparedness Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, Housing, Mobile Home, Fair Practices, Planning Commission, Speaker Series, and Traffic Safety Commission. Again, I thank you for your commitment and time uh, devoted to our city. Now, we're going to be asking for applications to all of these commissions uh, now up through May. Uh, we will be reappointing individuals. Some individual decide that they want to continue. Others may not. So I would encourage you to uh, look at our website, take a look at the commissions that are available, and submit your applications. So again, many of you that would like to get involved with the city, uh, please uh, contact uh, uh, either our city clerk or take a look at our website. This is your opportunity to participate, and we will welcome you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ted. Council Member Marker, do you have a comment? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Mulatto, do you have a comment? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, to touch on the Children's Discovery Museum, I had the pleasure of meeting with uh, Cindy Burleson last week on her vision, and uh, it is amazing, and I'd like to commend her efforts. She, her diligence and her persistence and the growing partnerships that she's acquiring to keep the future of our children here in Rancho Mirage alive. Um, I, I won't go into any more detail because Steve's council member uh, down stole my thunder, but, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, she's doing remarkable work over there and we're thrilled to be a part of it. Uh, the Jocelyn Senior Center is also one of our deserts, great resources for the senior community and the city of Rancho Mirage is most proud to be affiliated with it. The Jocelyn Senior Center is hosting their Jocelyn in Bloom Fashion Show Luncheon on Thursday, April 13th, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Agua Caliente Casino Resort and Spa. And the event begins at 11 a.m. with a sparkling wine reception and silent auction, followed by a three-course luncheon. Uh, there's a live auction and a fashion show produced by Susan Stein Style. General seating is $75 and VIP seating is $150. For more information, please call Tom Belenich at 760-340-3220, and they'll kindly present you with a ticket. I'd also like to remind our citizens that on Tuesday, March 21st at 7 p.m., the Ranch from Raj Speaker Series is presenting its third and final speaker for the 2023 season, also at the Agua Caliente Resort. We're featuring boxing great and Hall of Famer Sugar Ray Leonard, and he'll hit the stage at 7 p.m. He's an Olympic uh, gold medalist and uh, Hall of Famer, winning five championship titles, considered one of the greatest pound-for-pound -pound boxers of all times, and he's now known as a best-selling author. Individual tickets range from $60 to uh, $125 VIP box Tickets that are available at $200 per person with food and private suite. And you're welcome to call the City of Rancho Mirage Marketing Department at 324-4511. And uh, they'll connect you with the Marketing Department. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Mr. Mayor, may I? Yes. For just a moment. So I, I, I just want to uh, say thank you, uh, Lynn, for mentioning Cindy Burson. Uh, I, I do think that Cindy and her board of directors have done a remarkable job under very difficult circumstance, circumstances, and I wish them well in finding a way to get that museum open sometime, hopefully sometime this year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Steve. I, obviously, you can tell that everybody on the council is certainly anxious to see the museum open. So we'll continue to talk about the pluses and continue to ask for donations because that's what they really need at this point. 
There are a couple of other items that we did not talk about so far tonight, so I'd like to cover those with you. The upcoming weekend, desert uh, theatrical production of Beauty and the Beast is happening at our beautiful outdoor amphitheater. And can we have a video on that? Desert theatrical season of musicals at the Rancho Mirage Amphitheater. Join us for Broadway's best, including Disney's Beauty and the Beast and Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Enjoy a three-course waiter-served meal under the stars or general admission seating with food options from Lulu California Bistro. Come see what everyone is talking about. Tickets are going fast, so visit desert-theatricals.com. That's desert-theatricals.com for the best theatrical events in the desert. Tickets are still available, both general admission and dinner tickets. What you need to do is to contact Desert Theatrical and uh, they'll give you information on purchase, purchasing the tickets. Another item in Rancho Mirage over the next couple of weeks is the Rancho Mirage Community Culture Commission. And they'll be putting on their 10th annual uh, Rancho Mirage Artist Walk and Pop-Up Gallery. And that'll be on Saturday the uh, 25th, and that's from 4, or actually from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Rancho Mirage Library. This self-directed self unique provides a multitude of opportunities for you to meet the actual, ex, the artist of the uh, pop-up. And lastly, uh, on Sunday, March 26th at 7 p.m., the CV Symphony will be presenting Moody Blues' John Lodger at the Rancho Mirage Amphitheater. You can get more information on all of these items by calling City Hall at 760-324-4511. Okay, with that all taken place and you know what you can all be able to do for the next few weeks, uh, we'll now continue with the agenda and call on the city manager for his comments. None today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. You're not going anywhere, Isaiah. <laughs> we'll plan something for you. Okay. With that going by, we'll now uh, go to the uh, uh, consent calendar, which is also taken by our city manager, Isaiah Hagerman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, you have six items on your consent calendar for consideration. Item number one is to waive the full reading of all ordinances introduced or adopted pursuant to this agenda. <clears throat> Item number two is to approve the March 2nd, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Item number three is to receive and file the annual board commission reports. Item number four is to approve the final acceptance of the Tamaris Neighborhood Slurry Project. Item number five is to approve the contracts list and item number six are demands and staff is uh, available to answer any questions before we go to council comments or questions. I'll turn this over to the city clerk for public comments. Thank you. I do not have any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on the consent calendar? And seeing no one, there are no speakers. Hey, thank you. Uh, council, any questions, comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull item three for discussion. Okay. okay uh, any other comments? Uh, yes, specifically the speaker series uh, commission report. Um, and, and just to, you know, follow up with that, um, when I took the oath of office, I said to myself that I would always do what's best for our city and our residents and I would treat the money that we spend as if it were my own. I'd like to revisit the speaker series as we are accepting applications um, for the next uh, season uh, for commissioners as this series lost a tremendous amount of money and the attendance was very low. As the series was not supported by the residents, we need to ask ourselves, is this really something the residents want to continue? And if we decide to continue the speaker series moving forward, it's my recommendation that we completely restructure it. In good faith, we cannot lose this kind of money. Okay, uh, any other questions, comments? 
I do have a question. So uh, are we pulling that item? Uh, we're, we're here to approve the uh, report for the past year. We're not here, I think, or this item on the agenda is not specifically to determine whether we continue or discontinue any specific commission. This is an acceptance of reports. So are we suggesting that for some reason we pull that item from the agenda because there's a fault with the report? Because I don't think there is. Isaiah? <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is just simply a receive and file. Uh, so each commission annually submits their annualized report to the council. Uh, so there's, uh, other than just acknowledging the reports, uh, this isn't a, um, agendized topic on the speaker series itself. It's just the receive and file of the report. Okay, so I assume we're voting on the, the consent calendar intact with no uh, exceptions? Is that what you're saying or? That's correct, no. yeah. Okay. Yeah, city attorney, would you advise us on that? That's, that's correct. This is just a receive and file. The discussion um, regarding the speaker series, you know, that's an, that needs to be on the agenda, so that perhaps that can be added to a future agenda. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to vote on this issue. So we have a motion. So moved. Mr. Mayor, based on that, uh, I would move to approve the consent calendar uh, as is items one through six. Second. Okay, there's a motion to approve, and there's a second. Would you please vote? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, thank you. Mag, you can work on that for the next year as the process goes on, and I think uh, uh, you'll get a lot more information at that time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, okay now we'll move on to the reports and information items, and we'll begin with the introduction of Ian Lastly, Assistant uh, Director of Public Works, uh, with uh, Ryan Stendell, Director of Public Works. Ryan? Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Um, some of the Council Members may remember back in October, uh, we began a uh, recruiting process to fill the Assistant Public Works Director position. I'm happy to report that we were not only blessed with a very uh, good stack of candidates, but uh, we have hired uh, Ian Lastly, who's sitting so stoically in the front uh, row. Uh, we're very fortunate, there's the laugh. Um, we're very fortunate to uh, steal Ian back to the Coachella Valley as he was born and raised here uh, from Coronado down in the San Diego region. He's very familiar with the needs of a community like uh, Ranch Mirage and I'm very grateful to have him on board. Ian, if you want to step up to the podium and say, uh, say hello, more than welcome to... Not sure exactly what to say, but uh, thank you guys for the warm welcome. Um, inherited a great team to work with, so uh, I look forward to keep the... Uh, the momentum going is with what uh, we've been doing here. So yeah. otherwise, so, thank you very much for the warm welcome. So Ian will be primarily stationed uh, at the yard facility, but you will see him intermittently here at City Hall. And we're again, very grateful to have him on the team. Congratulations. Thank you very much. If I may, a couple of us uh, met Ian yesterday at the uh, Parks and Trails Commission. So uh, happy to have you with us and uh, happy to see your participation, already your participation in some of our commissions. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, thank you. And you're fortunate to be able to uh, hang out at the yard facility so uh, you won't be harassed regularly here at City Hall. But I want to assure you, you will not escape harassment. No, I'm not, only a phone call away. Great. <laughs> Welcome. All right, thank you very much. Well, uh, Ian's been here for a week, so that's a pretty good sign. He survived all the initial time. So. Yeah, <laughs> made it two weeks. Oh, I'm on the second week now, so it's not too bad. All right, thank you. Okay, with that, we'll go on to item number eight, which is the destination marketing campaign. It's a preview by Gabe Cotting, who is the director of marketing. Okay. Do we need to public comment it's on the agenda? Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was just confirming with the city attorney. Uh, technically, that was on the agenda, so we should ask if any member of the public wishes to speak uh, on the introduction. So if, uh, I'm assuming we have no speaker cards. We do not have any speaker cards. Does anyone want to say anything uh, about our new <laughs> assistant public works director? Okay, go ahead and move on, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so we do not need to go to public vote on that? No, 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 that was just a report and information. Okay. Line. All right, so now we'll go back to number eight, 
which is the Destination Marketing Campaign previewed by Gabe Cotting, our Director of Marketing. Gabe, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council and staff and guests here today. Um, I'm excited to kind of showcase a couple things that are coming up. So as you recall, and I'll, you guys can bring up the uh, presentation whenever you're ready. <clears throat> as, you, as you may or may not recall, the city adopted a marketing master plan in 2021. Um, part of that plan, that marketing master plan, identified the city's current uh, destination marketing or tourism campaign. And it identified that that campaign was close to 12 years old. That had been created in 2008, 2009, and really hadn't been updated since. So the approved master plan um, also approved a brand concept um, and also directed staff to create a current campaign highlighting the elevated and enriching experience guests can expect when visiting Rancho Mirage. This presentation just walks you through a few of the, uh, of the new elements because we'll be, uh, these haven't been seen yet, but we do have a commercial unit going in next week's telecast at the uh, Gallery Classic. And then we also have some, uh, some advertisements going out. So I wanted, before you saw it on TV, I wanted you to see it here first. Let me get my, there we go. Uh, so the previous uh, campaign was, like I said, was in 2000. Uh, 8, 2009, kind of personality based. So here's kind of a, uh, a reflect of, uh, of, of that campaign that we've had. Here's page two of that. That was uh, across different ads, magazine ads, displays for, for, uh, for various things. Here's also, a, here's also a TV spot. So this, the city enjoyed a long history with the LPGA event, golf event. And so that was one of the city's biggest um, media buys, I would say, from a television standpoint. So I want to preview the spot that we previously had and kind of contrast to the spot we have coming up. So that was the 30-second spot that current that would run in the LPGA uh, the LPGA uh, events previously, and then here was a secondary spot that was created around 2015 to supplement that spot. So those really in our archives for the last 10 to 12 years have been really the only video assets that the city of Rancho Mirage has had on the tourism side to feature the destination. So as part of this plan, what we've uh, done over the last year, I'd say, is we've come out, we've taken 10 of our top attractions, the observatory, all of our resorts, Sunnylands, and we've done a series of video and, um, and photography. And so this is kind of a showcase of the brand and how it will translate across video, uh, digital ads, print ads, and then also in, in our eventual website, because our website's being redone as we speak. So here you've got, it's all built around an imagine, imagine tagline. So imagine a place where even the long road home seems too, far too short. This is the uh, hike up above the Ritz there. You see the watermark, and then we've, we're, we're transitioning from Relax Rancho Mirage to Visit Rancho Mirage. So our new website, we've, we've, uh, we've um, gotten that domain. And so here's another one at our Weston with their new slide. Imagine a place where the little moments seem larger than life. Here's the, here's the valet circle at the Ritz. Imagine a place where you always want to arrive, but you never want to leave. Imagine a place where the only thing more stunning than the backdrop is the company you're in. And then here's some photos kind of uh, right off the press. We, don't have, we haven't done the tagline to it. Um, but obviously for one, for Rancho Mirage, where, uh, imagine a place where that brings the stars closer to Earth. So we've got, uh, we've got Observatory, we've got the Omni, we've got Sensei Porcupine Creek. We actually uh, were filmed there within a week of them opening. And so their Nobu um, there and their uh, tennis hadn't been filmed yet. So they've actually used a lot of their assets and they're currently 
uh, in rotation for the, for that property as well. With Sunnylands, of course. And then uh, here's a two minute kind of scissor rule video. This is not final, we're still tweaking voiceover, we're still tweaking music, but this gives you an idea of how all that photography and video kind of rolls into a two minute uh, kind of highlight of the destination. Imagine a place that's elevated on every level. Or a place that stretches your body and your mind. Imagine a place where birdies tell tales. And where hard to describe is easy to find. A place where everything is in rhythm. Imagine a place where life just floats your way. Where there's always time for playtime. Where the day moves at your own pace. A place where the good life is the only way to live. This is Rancho Mirage. So I can assure you, uh, even though we're on projection and smaller screens here, your 80-inch TV at home, Mr. Mayor, will show up. This will show up really nicely on that when you see, when you see these commercials. Um, what that created is we took each venue and it created a mini vignette. And so what, what that does is creates an archive. So then based upon if I have a 30-second spot or the city has a 30-second spot in the Upham Gallery, we can go, hey, let's put in Sunnylands, let's put in Sensei Golf. Allows us to pick and choose and kind of mash that together. So we have the upcoming Gallery Classic. We needed a 30 part of our sponsorship, and that includes uh, sp spots on the Golf Channel. So I want to preview the 30-second spot that we'll be, be, be playing in our telecast uh, next week. Imagine a place where birdies tell tales. where hard to describe is easy to find. A place that brings the stars closer to Earth. Can you imagine? This is Rancho Mirage. And then as new, as new venues come online, so as the Catino Project comes online, Children's Discovery Museum comes back online, these are easy to go out and produce spots and then be able to come in together. So depending on what we're trying to market in the Valley, we have a very robust library and continued library. And this campaign has lots of years uh, available to it. So we wanted to build something that could last, that was relevant to today. And so here's how an ad would translate. So at the, at the Gallery Classic, they sent us you know, in their digital ad. So here's a couple ads that we created with the Imagine tagline. With, uh, with, so you have here with the meditation scene at, at Sensei and then the, uh, the infinity fountain out here at the Ritz. So a couple of examples that you'll see out at the tournament next week. And then here's kind of the, the, the city's current tourism website, the Relax Rancho Mirage and Where is Rancho Mirage website. Um, and then this shows you too, the next slide shows you now how this new photography and video, because a lot of websites now use a lot of video, so having that raw footage and all that video and those scenes allow us to kind of translate into a new website. So this new website will be debuted in the next couple months. It's being built right now. So with that, I'm available for any comments or uh, questions, and we can open it up to public comments as well. Gabe, are you asking for any kind of monetary support at this level? No, this has already been accounted for within our budget over the last two cycles. So this was approved, and the budget was approved over the last two, uh, the la when the marketing master plan was approved.
okay. and has been part of the regular marketing budget over the last couple of years. How about some public comments? Okay, I have not received any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? And there are no public comments. Okay, any questions or comments from the council? Gabe, um, can you talk to us about uh, how, um, or what kind of what conversations you may have had, if any, with uh, Visit Greater Palm Springs, and how we'll tie in our marketing campaign with them? Yeah, so you know, part of, part of establishing a marketing master plan, like so, when I got here four years ago, there wasn't a, a, a master plan in place. There wasn't a media buy plan, there, and so as as you look through, and as uh, you know, the council has been briefed in the, in, in the past. Um, you know, most of what the marketing department should be doing, at, 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 at my suggestion, um, is highlighting the destination, working with your resorts, working on media buys outside of the area and bringing attractions and in, in, um, in bringing people in here. And so, and we work very closely with Visit Greater Palm Springs. They do a fantastic job of highlighting the destination. So we often dialogue. Their job is to take somebody who's looking at worldwide travel get them sold on the destination, it's then our job to make sure that they land in Rancho Mirage. So we dovetail very closely and work very closely with them. So we've previewed this campaign, much like we've done with the council, got any feedback from them initially um, on some of their thoughts, but we did sit down with Scott and his team and kind of preview this um, when we initially um, had the concept. So yeah, we're, we're excited to kind of debut this and, and have a, a full, full library of assets and that we can continue to build on in the future as well. Any other questions, comments? No, I, I think, Gabe, uh, when you first presented this, uh, I don't believe uh, there had been an announcement yet about the Galleria Classic. And I think that's, again, uh, a, a new bonus uh, for the program that's going to be, uh, you know, certainly uh, a great stimulant for, uh, you know, for the marketing department. Anything else? Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And for those of you who would like to see more of Gabe Cotting, we have the next item, City of Rancho Mirage, 50th anniversary. Gabe, it's yours again. All right, back to back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, again. Thank you, Council. Let me get my stuff here. All right. So this is to uh, touch base on the, 50, the, the city's 50th anniversary. Most of us know here that on August 3rd of this year, our, uh, our great city turns 50. And so one of the things we presented back at a uh, study session on the 19th of January is really one of the first meetings where our current council was all together. Uh, staff had, had presented a list of ideas, of just thoughts of how one or an organization could celebrate the 50th anniversary. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to specifically address the feedback that was given in that study session and then really so staff can start implementing because the clock certainly is ticking on our 50th anniversary. So with that, I'm going to walk you through just a few things, um, but really a, uh, following up on kind of what was discussed at that study session. This was the uh, specific feedback from the council um, uh, study session. And so one comment was the inclusion of Eisenhower. And so I'm going to touch, a touch briefly on the, the sub-bullet points of those of how that bullet point would, would be accounted for and what's being presented in the plan to implement. Um, but it'll go into deeper, deeper context as we go through the, uh, the overall presentation. So uh, what you'll see in this was a commemorative coffee table book. So certainly the inclusion of Eisenhower, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing um, resource that continues even with its, uh, its newest announcements of the cardiac, uh, you know, cardiology uh, center. Um, this would also be included in our video documentary series and then, our, and then our website that would archive both the book footage and the video footage as well. Um, how, the, another comment was, how can our retailers and visitors participate? Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of events partnering with the Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce like we do on most of their events. Uh, you know, you look at, you have the summer, um, you know, you have the, um, you know, the summer event for the dine, summer dine campaign. Um, lots of local businesses, local organizations, and event attractions, so we'll preview that. Um, highlighting entertainers in Rancho Mirage. Again, the, com the commemorative coffee table book, the video documentary series, and the website is meant to kind of capture a lot of the history and accolades from there. 
It was also uh, asked, what about golf and professional golf? Again, uh, the commemorative coffee table book, the video, the website, but there's also the gallery classic that's now here um, that there's an opportunity to potentially partner in and come up with a theme for our, you know, certainly the city's 50th anniversary and the history of just professional golf. We've had a, this will be the 52nd year of continuous professional golf in Rancho Mirage, so it even predates our birthday. And then the chamber holds an annual golf tournament every year, so there may be opportunity. Uh, staff's not recommending going and starting our own golf tournament at this point, but potentially partnering with existing events that would happen. Um, honoring the, 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 city, uh, the city's history and key accomplishments, again, that would be accomplished through the book, the, um, the uh, video series, and the website. Uh, it was also suggested that selling advertisements in the 50th anniversary commemorative book could help offset some of the costs. So we do have some of those options and what those would kind of look like um, as well. And then finally, uh, it was suggested at uh, that concert series in the city's amphitheater us utilizing music producer who presented here, Jim Fitz, Fitzgerald, who presented here at the, uh, um, at the study session. Um, this was, this did go to the city manager and, and his update was um, there was a uh, fair practices uh, commission um, issue that they had opinionated on and so it's uh, right now it's not recommended that this one be pursued at this point so uh, like with any good campaign this the staff is is recommending and would create a campaign a 50th year if directed here today um, and if this is the the direction we're going we would create a 50th campaign um, with a logo, much like we did at our 40th, that would be on our signature lines. It would be branded around the city. Uh, one idea that's kind of come up that one, somebody on our team had is, what if we use some of the most famous faces that are in Rancho Mirage along the, that have street names or playing on the playground of presidents, things like that. So there's a couple campaign ideas that we would be starting over the next several weeks and come back with some ideas on how the 50th campaign um, could be presented throughout that way, touching on all the elements from there. Uh, that same campaign would then be branded throughout the city. You've seen this before. Um, again, City Hall, the, the library, we have Street Banner Program. We have uh, all kinds of space to be able to really kind of celebrate that. So uh, staff would, would put together a final plan and cost and timeline of, of a large format branding um, campaign across the city to celebrate the 50th year anniversary. One of the biggest elements that, that staff is proposing is a commemorative coffee table book. Um, and so the city has enjoyed a long standing partnership with Palm Springs Life. In fact, publisher uh, Frank, Frank um, Jones is here um, in case we have any questions uh, at the end of this. But the city for about seven, eight years created a, an annual magazine. Um, that same kind of team that created that magazine is in place, so the timing to be able to collect the, the amazing archives that Palm Springs Life has and all the stories and a lot of the things that are already collected on behalf of, of the city of Rancho Mirage through that magazine. So here's a couple options. One is a softbound cover. Oblong would be option number one and the price point for that. Uh, at the 10,000 10, quantity mark, that, that made sure every resident got one. And then that has that, um, there's about 6,800 I think residents, we counted if every single resident's got a, a book shipped to them. That also leaves some for gifts uh, and to be in some of our hotel gift shops or some of our specialty shops around Rancho Mirage. Option number two is a, uh, is, is a hardbound one, but with less pages, a little bit um, incrementally, a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Option number three would be the 10,000 quantity, 164 pages, hardbound cover. It would also include the dust jacket gold fo foil embossing, basically kind of the, you know, the, the highest end of the book, of the commemorative coffee table book. And then option number four, there's selling advertorial, and we have some samples that we want to show from here. Uh, in meeting with Palm Springs Life, uh, one, one could anticipate, now the city would have to start the project, we'd have to underwrite the whole thing before the, before the revenue would come in, but uh, it's estimated between twenty and $45,000 could be recouped off that cost if we were selling those in five to $10,000 increments. Um, and that would add about five to 10 Rancho Mirage based companies for advertorial. Here's just a couple of previews. This is just a comp set that Frank and his team put together. So again, if, if moving forward, the city would then tighten up, you know, the staff would tighten up the table of contents and tighten up all the, um, you know, all the content that would go in this, and then that would really create the, the, the map moving forward. 
Um, you got, of course, you have the early years. You have the, the country club, the formation of the country club with Thunderbird, world, our world-class resorts and how they came to be, their origin stories, Eisenhower Health, Sunnyland Center and Gardens, uh, you know, club architects, some of the architecture uh, here is world-class and is becoming world-class now that we're 50. Um, you know, looking at our history is, is a super important part of that as well. And then, and then even a, a shot to the future, what the future looks like in Rancho Mirage, because we, we, we do have some ideas on what that's going to look like over the next couple of years. So again, this, is, this would be a high-end commemorative coffee table book that would be, um, that would have, we build it in a way that it would have some life, not, uh, not a, a, we'd prolong the shelf life as much as, as much as possible. Here's an idea of the selling of the advertorial. Uh, again, this is what advertorial, uh, Frank and his team kind of mocked that up. So if you had, say, say, something from an Indigo Auto Group or you had something from a Dell Webb, uh, it, they would try to make it look as organic as possible within that. <clears throat> so it wouldn't just be something that had ads. It would be more of an advertorial where, um, where we'd be working there. And, you know, some of the is, you know, you would have a couple extra stakeholders within the, the, the book itself, um, but it, it can be done. Um, the one thing about the book, so as, as we go from the book to the documentary series, uh, we have a unique skill set in-house right now. So we have the city has a videographer. Um, and so our goal would be to, now that that videographer has been in-house for a little over a year, we'd look to take the same table of contents that the book has. And we're, we're doing interviews, we're collecting photos. If those people are still around willing to talk, um, you know, want to be on camera, creating these two to three minute mini documentary series um, along with the great work that Frank and his team would be putting together in the articles and the photography. And that comes at a relatively low cost. We have that in-house. So even though the book is a significant resource and allocation of funds, we do have a unique resource to utilize internal resources to create this documentary series along the same path as the book. And then all of that would be housed on the city's website. If you go to the city's website right now and you go to our history page, you have a, a, a YouTube video that's probably 10 years old that kind of focuses on just this, the, you know, the history of the city. It's very well done, and in its day, it was very well produced, but that's really the only thing. This thing would be a long form produced that has the articles that Palm Springs Life would help create, the photos linked to videos, so it would be a very robust section of Rancho Mirage history where it wouldn't just be, uh, that could be housed within the city's website. Um, also, another part, uh, another opportunity is is preserving the history of Ranch Mirage. We have organizations like Preservation Mirage and Modernism Week that have taken root um, within um, within Ranch Mirage. And so, uh, one of the ideas that we talked about at the uh, at the study session was the the preservation and then also the historical designation of the Elephant Car Wash that's being spearheaded uh, sign being spearheaded by Preservation Mirage, uh, which I think would be you know which which could be a fantastic. Um, Thing to include in here. We've also talked about doing, uh, making a bitter, a bigger uh, opportunity for the for Modernism Week's fall preview here in Rancho Mirage. Again, with Preservation Mirage, and then they've got a whole list of ideas between fashion and car shows featuring icons and and celebrity homes and things like that. So there's a lot of ideas floating around. So I think being able to partner with with organizations that um, are celebrating the city's history currently and have been, there's an opportunity there as well. There's an opportunity to take the, the themed events and sponsored events that the city's doing. So at our city's amphitheater, for example, we have uh, the Broadway Under the Stars. We have a partnership with the Coachella Valley Symphony. We have our holiday show, entertainment series, our Festival of the Arts. So looking for key ways to be able to theme those events and celebrate the 50th anniversary from those that make sense. As I mentioned previously, it makes sense to... Uh, Anywhere we have an existing partnership within the city or uh, Rancho Mirage resident-based business, uh, the Gallery Classic. We we also have a Palm Springs Power Day uh, with with resident uh, that that owns and operates the Palm Springs Power, and then we certainly have a great relationship with the Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce and with their Taste of Summer and the Ramy Awards as well. Additionally, we've got some key brands here um, that are kind of iconic and locally owned. So we've got coffee. So one of the things uh, proposed and talked about in our, um, in our study session would be creating a 50th anniversary roast, a specialty Ranch and Raj roast, where it have branding, specific branding according to our 50th anniversary. We've, been, we've had uh, discussions with Bay Brew House about creating a specialty gold, golden anniversary ale or lager. 
uh, and a unique brand and sold at RM events and they would sell it in their, uh, in their, for this, the first brew pub in the desert as well. And then also our, of course, our Brandini toffee, which is everywhere, um, be doing a special label with them, uh, and or product, but most likely special labeling or packaging celebrating the city's 50th anniversary. Um, the city, um, city would also embark on a, on a, you know, a, a standard communication plan where there would be, uh, you know, the city's 50th anniversary, all of the events. Uh, Council Member Marker brought up a good, uh, the McCallum piece that just came out. Uh, it hit mailboxes here the last month or so, uh, doing a, a direct mail to residents, uh, rack cards and area businesses, printed mailers, social media, digital media, the mayor's message and, and weekly message. So this would be a full, full-fledged full campaign on how we get the word out of the celebration and the events that we'd be, uh, we'd be celebrating. Um, and so, you know, lastly here, you know, based on the elements of this plan outlined the council and council feedback from this report, staff will begin implementing the plan to celebrate the city's 50th anniversary. Uh, staff will ensure um, all the elements are accounted for in the upcoming two budget, uh, two year budget cycle. And then in addition, much like the previous uh, update, um, staff will bring, you know, bring back updates uh, to council as plans are refined and details are solidified. So with that, I'm available for any questions or comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, what's the timing on this, Gabe, as far as hitting the market? Well, we can't change our birthday. So uh, August 3rd, so the, the, the recommendation from staff is August is not a great time to have, a, have an actual birthday party here. So the idea would be communication would start about all the celebrations and the festivals. So what's nice is a lot of these things that you see in the presentation could be solidified, uh, accounted for in our upcoming budget cycle and planned for, and then we'd feel comfortable on announcing some of them, uh, if not in teasing more to come, and then really treating this as when the season starts, October-ish, you could do kind of a season of events from, you know, from Q4 October of 2023 through April, even May of 2024, and do a season long of events celebrating the city's 50th year anniversary would be staff's recommendation. Okay, so uh, Madam Clerk, do we have? We do not have any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? And there are no comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions, comments from the council? Um, from a personal standpoint, uh, I'd like to see a hardcover uh, book as opposed to a, a loose. I, I think a hardcover has a, just a little more uh, permanency and uh, a feeling of more importance and something uh, so significant as this 50th anniversary, uh, I think it deserves something uh, uh, of, of a permanency. So my, my preference would be to, uh, to be a, a hardcover uh, uh, book. Coffee table type of book? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Questions, answers? Well, I'd like to uh, uh, support uh, Council Member Weil's suggestions. You're only 50 once. So it's only I have a one time. You tell us. What's the, yeah. <laughs> I don't see a big difference between uh, what was $155,000 and $175,000. So uh, yeah. I think that, uh, that the right thing to do is to really make this a commemorative book uh, that will last a long time. Gabe, are we still collecting data or working with internal groups to finalize some of the things that we're doing? I think a lot of people would like to get involved in the decision-making process and are we there yet, or can we continue to work on this and bring more ideas in? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly the, the study session that was, you know, a month and a half ago was really the, the initial part. And so what we tried to do is take all the feedback from that one. If an idea, you know, I'm certain an idea, uh, you know, like we all do when we start down a path, an idea is going to pop up and something's going to happen. Um, and so what staff would like to do is at least get started with the semblance of this. And then as things pop up or, or uh, things happen, we can certainly evaluate it. If they take resources, we can come to council and uh, with the idea and the resource request uh, and the resource allocation request. But certainly it can remain fluid, but we do, we do need to get started. Um, okay. So that, that would be my recommendation. Great. 
Any other questions or comments down here? Uh, I do have another. Uh, just uh, uh, I'm assuming, Gabe, that you're also asking us to make comment on whether or not uh, we promote some form of uh, advertorial in the uh, in the book. You're looking to us to. Uh, comment to you as to what yeah, I mean dir think direction in that matter is helpful and we we also have Frank here though I've asked him to join here just today because I'm not obviously I'm not the expert in you know book production so I've asked kind of the expert um, resident expert to to join us um, from there but we certainly could certainly can be part of the discussion having direction in that area which is helpful would be helpful and as I recall from your numbers we're, we're talking uh, revenue generation of not a lot of money maybe Thirty-ish thousand dollars or so. For, if we were to do that, that's roughly what we're, is suggested to us that we might raise. Yeah, Frank and his team said, "Look, there's a handful. You know, his his recommendation said if you're going to go down that route, um, then you you'd probably want to keep it Rancho Mirage based. So at that point, you've got maybe five to ten people. You got Eisenhower, you got Agua, you got Indigo Auto Group. So there's a handful of businesses." Um, you know, certainly. So it's whether or not does the city want to go. And, and he he said he'd want in a project like this, he'd want to go and approach them mutually between staff and his team um, because it's a special project and they can kind of give the context of it. So, um, you know, I think from staff's perspective, is it worth the, the you know, you know, certainly we want to be as prudent. And that's why we've said, hey, with the with the video series and everything else that this would would do, is it worth the twenty to thirty thousand to include eight to ten other people that are going to want to have their message uh, in a certain way? Is is it worth it from the monetary standpoint? So I think that's certainly not a you know a, a staff discussion. That's a, that is a policy level. And you're not suggesting front. to us that we do it. You're asking us what we think. Yeah, about. It, it was brought up at the at the previous study session. And so we're presenting those options. Well, I'd be interested in hearing what my council colleagues have to say about whether or not we should make this something of a commercial book uh, or if we should keep it as a commemorative sort of a coffee table piece for the people of this city. Uh, do, do, would you want to see ads in a book like this? I'd like to hear from others of what they think. If I may, um, an advertorial with a commemorative, commemorative book um, it, it would be a win-win. In, in, in my experience in the past in dealing with advertorials, the businesses that participate have an investment in the community. This is just an additional investment that they would share with their patrons, with the business, and, and other businesses as well. I think you could get um, additional participation, like from Sensei, um, potentially Cotino, because that's our future. Uh, so it... it, it we have established businesses that have been here for years, and we have businesses that we're looking forward to in the future, and I think it could be a win-win. Gabe, a few years ago, we embarked upon a, a booklet or a magazine that supported various uh, people from our city and did a, a whole write-up on them, and, and uh, I'm just wondering if we go back to something like that where we focus in on a series of, uh, of individuals that mean something to Ranch Mirage. I think in the, in the last one we did was on Rolls-Royce or the owner of Rolls-Royce. And uh, You're talking the annual magazine, RM Magazine? Yeah. I think Helene Galen was on the cover. I mean, certainly it featured, it featured quite a few various stories from there. Um, it would it be helpful to invite Frank to come up and maybe and give his perspective as the as the expert. I think that would help. I didn't want to have him drive down here all the way from Palm Springs to just sit here and not contribute. Very funny. If I may uh, quickly just add to circle back with the adversarials, um, I have seen uh, Frank's work that they do, have done in uh, Palm Springs Life, and they are very classy and you can't even tell that they're ads. They're beautiful promotional pieces of um, the um, businesses that choose to be in the magazine and so forth. So I think it's a beautiful idea um, and it would add some revenue um, as well. And then I do like the hardback item uh, from Council Member Weil as well. So Frank, maybe the from your perspective as the publisher, kind of the pros and cons, because you do this day in, day out, the pros and cons of kind of that ad, you know, because I, and, I, and I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, because I wasn't a part of any of them, was the magazine that we did, did that have advert, 
uh, advertorial in it? Yeah, it did. Okay. Yeah, it did. I think, uh, you know, I think if the consensus is that we give it a shot, there's no hurt. There's no harm in doing it. I mean, I think you saw the samples of the advertorials. I think we've put samples together that will blend well with the publication. Um, it, you know, it's just going to take. There's no guarantee that we're going to be successful out there with it once you enter the marketplace. You know, the, the marketplace dictates what that is, and uh, we can just give it a go and, and keep everybody abreast of how what our progress is on it. I mean, I think it seems pretty simple. If if unless there's hard objections to not going that route, yeah, uh, it's something that we can uh, you know take a stab at, and we're prepared for it. And I, I think it's worth pointing out when Frank and I had the discussion. You know, one of the things we're 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 targeting is potentially having this come out kind of during the city's uh, Riders Festival, the, the Rancho Mirage Riders Festival. We thought this would be, the timing could be work. So one of the things that Frank has stressed, a couple things that stood out to me. One, we don't want to make it time specific. So let's say Indigo Auto Group has a 2023, you know, Lamborghini in there that in two years from now, you're like, oh, that's kind of a timestamp, um, which I thought was very, um, you know, astute. And then the second was, you know, we don't really have time to go out and pre-sell this thing. Um, time's of the essence if we're going to deliver a great product in time. Um, so we're kind of right up against the deadline. We kind of paused this process, as we, as we mentioned, at the study session in order for the, you know, the newer council members to come on board and be kind of a part of the process and the discussion. So we probably lost a couple months um, from that. So, you know, it, certainly like to Frank's point, we could start there. There would be no guarantees, so we would, you know, we would have to kind of guarantee the whole number. But we could be doing that in parallel. But what staff wouldn't recommend, and I'm and I'm sure Frank wouldn't, per our discussions, we wouldn't want to try to go pre-sell this over the next thirty to forty-five days and lose that time when we could start some key work on the on the book. Uh, is that a fair? Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, definitely from a time standpoint, the de developmental part should start right away. So we would start both of these simultaneously. I think if it's a either or, if it's a, you know, don't start until you reach a certain level, I think that that can be challenge challenging, yeah, for, for sure. I guess what, one of the issues that I'm sensitive to is uh, I appreciate the look of the ads that were suggested, uh, and that's... That's what's a concern, I suppose, is to make sure that if we do it, that it fits with the general look as opposed to looking like it's an ad in a magazine sure. stuck into that book. Yeah, and, and it's a really good point. Um, we did consult with Gabe and his team on this look and feel of it. We made those look different enough so that they were distinguished from the regular editorial but they still had the feeling of the book so that it was this perfect blend. That's part of the art of getting out there and selling this thing and selling it in a way that uh, uh, meets those standards. And that's why we say once you get out there, you never know how people are going to respond. Either they're on board and they love it, or if they can't do their own thing, they say we're not, we don't want to be a part of it. And I think in those instances, we would you know, say, OK, we would just walk from that situation. Yeah, I think the book, at the end of the day, you know, historically, from the moment it's released, and then historically, you want it to something that you can be proud of, and that's going to have the longevity that Gabe's speaking to. I would just add, you know, one thing: um, in all the dynamics that Gabe presented, the the, the book itself actually, um, its content will have a tremendous media value that extends from the, just the hard copy of the book. Mm -hmm. We've worked it out with staff where those component parts break down and become content marketing pieces, that editorial in and of itself, across digital and social media as Gabe's organization sees fit to release it. And we'll also use it on our media sites. And we're reaching about 300,000 eyeballs every month in and out of this market. So there's a lot of value in there that uh, goes along with the book than that was just presented on the slide. So it's a pretty ter terrific package that uh, Gabe and his teams come up with, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. So I, I guess what you're telling us is that you're not looking for a decision today as to whether or not we include the advertorial component. You're telling us that uh, if we decide to sort of go ahead with it, at least give you some, uh, some direction that maybe we might be okay with it. If you can't find uh, signups, that's not a problem. It's easy enough to get rid of and to move on. That's right. Okay. Yeah. You know, Steve, I think we do want to get further along, though, on the process. And 
we're going to be in December and January before you know it. And uh, I think uh, something initially that you can put out in, in the uh, public and then build on it maybe as we go through the year. Uh, Potentially. I'm yeah, so, so what we would do, Mr. Mayor, is, is we would look to put this on the contracts list for our next April meeting so we could get started <clears throat> with the understanding that it doesn't look like anybody's, you know, completely opposed to the idea of having advertorial along is it meets the standards that Frank's just described in the, in the comps that we put in. So, but by, by moving forward, you know, essentially as soon as possible allows us to formulate those, have those conversations come back. So what we can do is even in the next couple of weeks, Frank and I can have that conversation of, of, uh, and then give it even a slight update, but this would be on the contracts list for the first meeting in, uh, in, in April. Good. I think we know the quality of, of Jones and their ability to do a, a real quality issue. So I think we can kind of go forward on that understanding that we're going to come up with the above average type of opportunity here. Yes, Mr. Mayor, but what I, what I anticipate, and Frank, is that and to uh, address Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor Pro Tem's uh, concern is that I see a high class ad that says essentially blank congratulates the city of Rancho Mirage on their 50th anniversary. In other words, it's an ad that congratulates our city, whether it be ex, you know, automobile agency, restaurant, whatever it is. It's going to be a congratulatory ad as opposed to come in uh, for our Monday through Friday special. It's not a retail ad, it's a con congratulatory ad, high class, uh, that has uh, legs as far as time is concerned. Uh, and I frankly anticipate that it will be more successful than what's being projected. I think that more people will want to congratulate the city on its 50th anniversary than you might anticipate. And so, uh, as far as funds are concerned, I view this as a bonus. In other words, whatever funds are, whether it be 30,000, 50,000, or 100,000, I view it as a bonus to everything else that we're doing. I don't view that as a uh, the necessity for proceeding. Uh, what I do see is more concept that this is a concept that's being appro approved, that we're going to go ahead and talk to various people as to would you like to get involved in congratulating the city? I find it hard to conceive that a lot of people would say, no, I don't want to congratulate them. They're doing fine. More than you would anticipate are going to say, boy, count me in. Boy, I'm so. going to take you with me out there on the street, <laughs> Ted. You, you, uh, <laughs> hey, keep in mind. I, I think you found I your cheap sales. Guy. Yeah. yeah, okay. I was a media guy before. I, I, I got I your number. You know that, don't you? <laughs> uh, there's somebody in the audience that's familiar with the fact that, yeah. you know, I sold media for a long time. All right, great. Anyway, that's where I'm coming from. Okay. Thank you, Council more? Member. Questions, comments? Uh, we're, we're good on our side. If, if there's any other questions, we're happy. But thank you, Frank, yeah, for okay, being thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to the next opportunity to look at the product. Mr. Mayor, before we uh, uh, move on to the next item, I have two requests. Uh, the first one is for a five-minute recess. And then the second request is when we return, unless there's an objection by the council, uh, due to some uh, travel requirements, I would like to move up item number 13 to be considered next right after we come back from our recess. We will recess for five minutes. Okay, we're back from recess and uh, we have a comment from the city manager. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. So uh, we're moving up item number 13 to be considered next. So that is consider uh, implementation of a Rancho Mirage Power Choice Solar and Battery Residential Program. And Jessica Pulliam will be giving the staff report. Jessica. Thank you, Isaiah. Hello, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon, members of City Council. The item I have for Council's consideration is a new RMEA program. Power Choice is a no-cost solar plus batteries program. With us today here in the audience is Kathy Wells and Kathy Del Falco from CalChoice, as well as Stephen Pollock from Participate Energy. They will be available to answer any questions um, that come up that are technical in nature as needed. To provide a brief recap, the Rancho Mirage Energy Authority was established by City Council in late 2017 and began to serve customers in May of 2018. RMEA procures energy while SCE, in partnership, continues to service the lines, read the meters, and handle things such as billing, providing our customers with one bill that has both energy charges that go to RMEA and delivering transmission charges to SCE. RMEA customers enjoy cleaner, less expensive energy and benefit from local programs and rebates established by City Council, such as the $500 RMEA residential solar rebate with its recent expansion to include battery storage, as well as items such as the Ohm Connect smart home device program. Today's staff will be discussing the Power Choice program. This program was developed by a fellow CalChoice uh, member, Lancaster Energy, in conjunction with Participate Energy and Tesla. Their program successfully launched in October of 2022. They were the pilot program, and now RMEA is the first CCA outside of this pilot to bring forth this opportunity to implement this program in our community. Now let's dig into what this program does. Encouraging our community to move forward to distributed microgrids provides numerous benefits to our residents, to developers, and to the RMEA program. A distributed microgrid is a localized behind the meter energy resource that self generates renewable energy and allows disconnect from the grid with the ability to continue to operate independently outside of an outage or during an outage, excuse me. Now let's look at what this looks like visually. RMEA procures power from a balanced portfolio of resources. See across the top section of this slide. And then that power is distributed to our customers. Those with solar will pull power from the grid as needed and feed power back onto the grid as it's produced. The green home to the left here represents a home with solar plus whole home battery backup. The exchange on the grid is minimal. This home is able to store its power into its batteries for use later, reducing this customer's delivery and transmission costs. At night, we can see that as solar is no longer available, as it's not being produced, these homes with just solar are strictly being fed energy off the grid. The dynamic of homes with just solar can create grid instability during times of peak demand. Um, as solar production begins to wane and evening demand increases, customers return home and they begin to use more energy. While the microgrid home can use the energy that it produced during the day that's being stored in its battery, reducing demand of grid resources. In the event of a power outage, this microgrid home is able to continue to operate and power any medical devices um, as those, um, and those without battery backup, for example, even the homes with solar that do not have battery um, will not have any power until that grid comes back up unless they have alternative sources for that. For our customers, microgrid homes create resiliency by enabling whole home backup and emergency power. Having this be behind the meter largely avoids utility distribution and net metering fees as power isn't being exchanged on and off the grid. And for RMEA, this program creates grid stability, using battery storage to reduce peak demand, creating green energy locally that RMEA can use to meet state requirements. Rather than going out and investing in large out of the area solar and battery projects, RMEA can receive its needed renewable energy credits right here where our customers can benefit as well. Introducing Power Choice, a zero upfront cost for homeowners to go solar plus batteries. The program partners of this would be Tesla Inc., a leading electric vehicle charging solar and battery manufacturer, as well as Participate Energy, a team that comes from corporate credit that has successfully developed over 250 megawatts of rooftop solar and has lent over 5 billion. 
Through an agreement with RMEA, Tesla Inc. and Participate Energy, homeowners will be able to receive 100% renewable energy from solar and batteries on their home without having to purchase a system, and RMEA will be able to procure green energy locally, enhance green grid stability, and move the community to a more resilient future. So how will this actually work? If council approves this program, RMEA, Tesla, and Participate Energy will come to an agreement and a program will be implemented. Homeowners that desire to participate will find a simple online form on the RMEA website where they will put in their home details. Tesla will reach out to the homeowner directly and begin a site assessment providing sizing recommendations to meet the current and future power needs of that homeowner. The homeowner will have final design approval and will oversee that panel placement. After design, if the homeowner desires to move forward, they will sign a 25-year contract and be enrolled in the program. Participate Energy provides the funds to Tesla for building the system, and the system will be owned by Participate Energy. Tesla installs the system, and the homeowner begins to enjoy 100% renewable energy with all maintenance and servicing of those panels handled by Tesla. As the system generates power, Participate Energy sells that power to RMEA. RMEA turns and sells that power to the homeowner. The homeowner is able to enjoy renewable energy, backup power, and still continues to only receive one bill from SCE. The cost per kilowatt hour is anticipated to be approximately 14 and a half cents with a set annual escalator of one and a half percent. Through this program, our customers will have access to batteries at a set cost of 150 per month for the first power wall and 75 per month for each additional power wall they desire with no annual escalator on those power walls. If the home is ever sold, that system agreement is transferable to the new owner with absolutely no credit checks. And in addition, at any time after the first five years of that agreement, if the owner wants to purchase the system, they may do so at fair market value per the agreement. Homeowners and developers who participate in this voluntary program will enjoy a host of benefits. These include easy access to solar financing installation, continuation of one bill with the existing utility service, access to backup power in the event of emergency, a $500 rebate through the RMA solar battery rebate program, and of course there is expected savings on their electric bills. If this program is approved, the city attorney will review and negotiate final agreement terms before the program is implemented. This concludes my presentation and I would be happy to address any questions. Thank you, excellent presentation. Uh, let's see, do we uh, need com uh, public comment on this? Yes, we do. I did not receive any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on item number 13? And there are no comments. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions, comments from the council? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> when I first read this, um, I, I wasn't, wasn't sure of the motivation for the program whether the motivation was to benefit the city and or benefit the customer. I've since had a chance to learn more about it, and I can see that it would be mutually beneficial. Um, my question now is on a continuing, ongoing basis. How much involvement do you see the city um, as it relates to the program, whether it be answering questions, whether it be, I understand uh, how the program works from, from us uh, selling the energy uh, to the customer, uh, but how much ongoing involvement will it be? For example, uh, are we gonna be the main contact as far as the program is concerned, and will it be an ongoing uh, involvement as far as our staff is concerned. Staff does not anticipate an increased workload here at City Hall. Uh, Tesla and Participate Energy would be doing the actual onboarding um, and it would be just typical questions as what we get for RMEA. Yeah, we, at, at the, uh, you know, obviously um, people will come into City Hall and we're happy to you know, answer questions about the program now. I've done that myself. Um, 
just happen to be walking by the front counter and answer questions. So we, of course, will uh, get inquiries and things of that nature, but kind of like the turf rebate program, you know, there were quite a few people that called to the city and said, hey, I want to find out, like, apply for the turf rebate program, and our staff was trained to get them over to CVWD. This program will work much the same, that in the event that they do uh, contact the city or had questions, we'll be able to answer those and then direct them um, to participate energy who's going to be handling all the detailed uh, conversations with the homeowners. Is there a benefit to the current, uh, say, sun power uh, resident to convert the, from their program into the new program? So the program as presented today is for those that are not currently a solar participating program. There is potential to expand this program in the future, but that is not um, something being presented today. But it is potential to have something in the future where anyone who has solar and is looking to maybe add a battery, we could potentially expand this program. Um, but we need to look into it a little more and just kind of hash those things out with Participate Energy and Tesla. Okay, thank you. Any other Mr. questions? Mr. Mayor? So, um, Steve. so Jessica, the um, source of the funds to um, install the solar panels is, uh, is participate? Participate would, energy would handle that fund um, and it would be coming from um, those federal tax credits. Okay. And then, so who does the city then purchase energy from? Is it from participate? The, yeah, the fund that Participate Energy will and put together. And then the homeowner that um, that uh, has the panels installed on the roof, uh, as far as their cost of energy is concerned, they get their bills from Southern California Edison, uh, but their energy is provided by? RMEA. Okay. So they uh, essentially, they're not, get, uh, they're not getting uh, energy delivered to their home from the panels on their roof. They're getting it from RMEA. And no, we're the, buying it from Participate. So they would be using the energy that is produced there on their home, but those panels would be right. owned by Participate. So technically, Participate Energy would own the power, sell it right there on site to RMA. RMA would turn and sell it right there on site Got to it. that homeowner. And as far as the cost, the ultimate cost to the uh, to the homeowner who has these panels installed, um, is there uh, any estimate as to whether their cost goes up or down or stays about the same? Uh, or is there any way to predict that for the future? So it is anticipated what, what's in discussions right now is about 14 and a half cents per kilowatt plus $115 for that first power wall. When looking at that compared to the base choice um, and comparing it to renewable energy because they would be receiving 100% renewable energy, the initial start of this program, it would be anticipated for those customers to have a savings. Okay, so you don't, you don't have any estimate on roughly how what, what the magnitude of those savings might be? Not yet at this time, but so there would be a that, savings. That would be very dependent on that customer, right? And their individual right. usage profile. But what an individual customer will be able to do is work with Participate Energy, and they're gonna say, okay, how much energy are you using? And then uh, they'll say, okay, this is uh, the number of panels, this is how many batteries we're recommending. And then you'll begin to like fill in the blanks, right? So. It's going to be 14 and a half cents a kilowatt plus a one and a half percent escalator for every year after that. So a customer can say, okay, the system is going to generate X amount of kilowatts and here's, you know, what I'm going to pay. You know, now this is designed for um, customers that currently don't have solar. Right. Right. So, so they're paying for the energy that they're using now. It's just this is a, a no cost way to transition to um, basically a microgrid. Okay, so we're, we're not saying to any, uh, any uh, homeowner who, uh, who signs up for the system that uh, you're gonna get uh, any significant benefits, but there will be some benefits. Uh, it'll cost them a little bit less, uh, at least initially. Uh, for yeah, power. Yeah, so, you, you know, that gets very difficult to, you know, anticipate each individual right. How much homeowner's things might change. load and what when they're using it, you know, are they seasonal, are they, you know, so, so you get into um, some specifics, so, um, but the, the way that the contract is set up is once they start working with Participate Energy, Participate Energy will take what they've been doing yep. and then be able to give them estimates, right, and say, okay, this is what you pay now or this is what you had been paying and then here you go. Here's the rate escalators that if you stay, you know, um, you know, as you are, 
right? Here's the rate escalator under this program. And they'll be able to get, begin to fill in those numbers uh, for the customer so that the customer can make their own decision on, you know, again, it's a completely voluntary program. But certainly a significant benefit is the battery. So now they have battery backup. Now they know that if there is a power outage, they've got some uh, source uh, of energy. So there, there is a significant benefit to the homeowner. Mm -hmm. And there's a benefit to the city because now we have an alternate form um, from which, an alternate place from which we can purchase power, namely the rooftops in the city of Rancho Mirage. Yep. So, you know, at a very high level, this is just, uh, you know, obviously this program won't be for everybody in our community. Uh, we have a substantial uh, percentage of people that have already gone solar. And then uh, we have other people that will just say, hey, I, I want the full benefit. So I'm going to come out with, you know, the full cost of this and do it myself. So, you know, this program is essentially just utilizing the CCA to provide another benefit that some of our residents have. They don't currently have access to to where they now have another option. So we don't need to worry about finding some solar farm out in the desert to buy solar power from. We create the farm on our own rooftops. Said, yes. Yep. Yep. OK, understand. Thank you, Jessica. Jessica, are there any other cities in the proximity of Rancho Mirage that are operating this kind of a program? No. Do you consider not. Lancaster in proximity? Yes, <laughs> then yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> and, and the company Participation uh, Inc., uh, what kind of history do they have in operating in cities such as us? So they have done that initial pilot program there with Lancaster that has been successful thus far. And they've also, you know, established over 250 megawatts of solar, um, as well as lending over $5 billion in conjunction with tax credit um, related to rooftop solar. So they do have a significant amount of in, um, history in this space, um, but they're more than welcome to come up and share a little more about themselves if there's anything else they'd like to add. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments here? Can, uh, can we have a motion, please? I'll go ahead and make the motion uh, that the City Council approve the Ranch Mirage Power Choice Solar and Battery Residential Program and authorize the City Manager or designee to take all further actions to implement the same, including approving and executing all associated government agreements approved as to form by the City Attorney. I'll second that. Okay. Please vote. It never came up. It didn't come up. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay, one second. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Okay, thank you. So now we can uh, uh, thank you, Jessica, uh, for that report and all the work into that program. Um, now we can move back to item number 10. Okay. Under public hearings, uh, environmental uh, assessment case number EA22-0011 and conditional U.S. permit number CUP22-0005, the applicant is SmartLink. LLC on behalf of AT&T Wireless. And uh, Joy, are you handling the staff report? Yes, I am. Thank you okay. and Thank good you. afternoon, uh, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. For your consideration today is, conditional use per is a conditional use permit to install an AT&T cell tower in addition to associated ground level equipment and landscaping. The entitlement package includes planning case numbers EA22-0011 and CUP22-0005. Today's request is for the approval to install an unmanned 75-foot tall AT&T stealth wireless telecommunication facility designed to resemble a eucalyptus tree, also called a monoeucalyptus. The proposed project will also include ground level equipment within a 990 square foot enclosure and associated landscaping. The project site is located on Southern California Edison's property at the northwest corner of Monterey Avenue and Clancy Lane, which is shown as the parcel outlined in red. The subject property includes two zoning classifications, utility substation, 
which encompasses the site of the existing uh, electrical substation and very low density residential. The Mono Eucalyptus will be located on the very low density residential portion shown on the slide as the red star. All adjacent properties are residential uses with the exception of the CVWD well site on, along Clancy Lane, which is outlined in yellow on the slide. So the following slides will show photo simulations from different vantage points. Uh, this slide shows the view facing south on Monterey Avenue. This slide here shows the northwest view from Monterey Avenue. This slide here shows the west view from Monterey Avenue. And this slide here shows the south view from, from Verbenia Road. Here you can see the um, view from uh, the north view from Clancy Lane. The proposed design and placement of the facility was approved by Edison to ensure that the facility does not interfere with the substation's operations and to maintain the required clearances for their substation. The mono, mono eucalyptus and ground level equipment will be contained within a 990 square foot block wall enclosure, which is also AT&T's lease area. The equipment closure is located approximately 43 feet from the back of street curb along Monterey Avenue. Vehicular access to the facility will be off the existing 17-foot uh, wide driveway access off Monterey Avenue. AT&T and um, Edison have proposed a 12-foot wide non-exclusive access easement. On this slide, you'll see the equipment plan and all equipment will be located within the enclosure. Any equipment that's exposed will be painted to match the tree and or screened by landscaping. There are 20 pa panel antennas and 20 remote radio units proposed along with other support equipment. This slide here shows the north elevation. The mono eucalyptus will be a maximum of 75 foot tall, including the full, uh, fake foliage. The panel antennas are 65 feet tall from center line of the panels and are shown on the slide in green. The orange panels at 45 feet panel center line shows the potential location for future co-location for another carrier. So if another carrier wishes to co-locate on this facility, they will need to obtain a separate lease from Edison and submit plans to the city for review. In order to minimize the visual impact of the proposed facility, the applicant has worked with Edison to extend the existing landscape palette. Uh, the landscape proposes three 36 inch box bottle trees that are proposed around the facility. Um, five 15 gallon cat's claws vines will be planted to grow along the equipment enclosure uh, to further camouflage the enclosure. The Edison approved planting palette matches the existing trees and shrubs on site. No existing landscaping is proposed to be removed as a result of this project, and the only ground disturbances are within the footprint of the project site. The proposed landscaping complies with the city's landscape standards. So the city's development code encourages the placement of wireless telecommunication facilities in commercial, industrial, and public or, public or semi-public zoning districts wherever feasible. The subject property already contains an electrical substation, which makes this property an ideal location for the new facility. This slide here shows the proximity of the cell tower to the proposed, uh, to the nearest residential structure in each direction. Sufficient setback distancing and screening is provided, which will help minimize the visual impacts to the surrounding properties. The applicant provided propagation maps to show how AT&T's 4G LTE coverage will be impacted with the addition of this tower. The slide here shows the current coverage. The red star is where the proposed uh, project will be located. The green color shows the strongest signal, which is sufficient for most indoor coverage, whereas purple shows um, probable, su or for su probable sufficient open coverage, but it's likely not sufficient for indoor or in vehicle coverage. Staff has, 
staff had asked the applicant to provide additional information related to service coverage if the proposed facility was lowered to 55 feet in height. So as you can see it on this slide, uh, the in-building coverage ranges about from about 1,300 feet to 1,700 feet in radius. So in order to fill the gap in coverage, um, additional facilities would need to be considered in order to accomplish the same coverage as the proposed 75 foot tall mono eucalyptus. And this slide here shows the 75 foot tall mono eucalyptus as proposed. Uh, in comparison, you can see that the coverage after the installation of this uh, at this um, height um, is the most feasible and least intrusive location available in order to close AT&T's gap in coverage and significantly improve coverage in areas such as Eisenhower Medical Center, Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center, and adjacent residential communities. So due to the project's um, parcel's proximity to residential zone properties, staff advised the applicant to notify the adjacent um, homeowners associations. So on July 14th of last year, uh, the applicant mailed notification letters with tracking to adjacent HOAs. Staff did not receive any comments from the HOAs regarding the proposed project. The project has been reviewed for compliance with CEQA. CEQA guidelines section 15303 exemption provides for the construction and location of limited number of new small facilities or structures. So based on this proposed design uh, location and standard conditions of approval, the proposed project is a small facility with no expected significant effect on the environment. Therefore, the project is exempt from CEQA and no further environmental review is required. On February 22nd, 2023, the Planning Commission conducted a notice public hearing to consider the project. No, no public comments were received during that public hearing and the Planning Commission recommended approval of the project by a 5-0 vote. So as a part of this review, staff routed the project uh, for comments to city departments and responsible agency and any applicable comments received have been incorporated into the conditions of approval. Um, to this day, staff received one letter in opposition of the project citing impacts on health related to radio frequency emissions. Um, all correspondence received prior to the publication of that staff report um, have been included in the agenda packet. Um, otherwise, staff has not received any outside correspondence or comments in regards to this request. So staff recommends, uh, well, the Staff and Planning Commission recommends that the City Council A, approve the filing of a notice of exemption pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15303, and B, approve conditional use permit case number CUP 22-0005, subject to the conditions of approval and based on the content and findings in the staff report. This concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to address any questions the commissioners, uh, the council members may have. Um, the applicant, is, the applicant representing um, AT and T, is also here um, for any questions as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. That very thorough report. Uh, you mentioned that there was one letter that was returned, but it wasn't for the normal problems, and this had to do with radio waves. Was that? Uh, we received one letter of opposition, um, and they cited that they were opposed to the project because of the health-related uh, impacts from those radio uh, waves. Um, and then I also wanted to add, um, aside from that, we haven't received any phone calls or other written correspondence related to this project. Um, and then I'd also like to note that, um, so cell towers are required to operate within the regulations of the Federal Communications Commission. And um, according to the Telecommunications Act, local governments um, can't regulate environmental effects of the cell towers um, on health. Okay, can you speak a little bit about the, the timing on the construction, the approval and so forth? Typically, these, a lot of these uh, towers never get built. 
And so what's the likelihood that this is going to be built over the near term? Mr. Mayor, if, if, if you don't mind, we can definitely answer that question, but I would like to open up the public hearing on this item. Okay. Christy. Thank you. Now's the time for any public testimony on this public hearing item. I do not have any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who wanted to provide testimony on this item? And there is no one, Mr. Mayor. So can we get the applicant up here to answer the question? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Doheny. I'm here uh, on behalf of SmartLink Group and AT&T and available for any questions. So in the past, uh, to summarize the mayor's question, um, we've had a history of, of approving uh, entitling cell phone towers and then they never get built. So uh, is there an idea of when this one will, one, uh, will it get built? And if so, do you have a timeline? Uh, th <clears throat> this project is scheduled for 2023 to be constructed. Um, on, on receiving approval tonight, we would uh, prepare for submitting to building and safety. Uh, that timeline could be anywhere from 30 days to 90 days long term. Um, at that point, receiving uh, building and safety approval, <clears throat> then we would uh, schedule for construction likely third or fourth quarter. Thank you. A uh, question, <clears throat> uh, typical of this, uh, do you make it available to other carriers if they want to use this tower? It is available, and um, Joy did speak to that in her presentation on uh, co-location. Uh, so there is space on this facility for uh, another carrier uh, being who they may if they, if they require services in the area. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. One more question, and this is just for my education. Mm -hmm. On your process, it states that your company reached out to the respective HOAs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do the HOAs send a card, a letter? How do they communicate with their residents on this, on this uh, proposal? <clears throat> yeah, it, it's a mailer that we use. We use a third party to uh, produce and provide the, the mailers to the residents within uh, a certain radius of the facility. <clears throat> be it, whether it's 300 feet or 500 feet. Um, so that's provided to them uh, to give them the opportunity to uh, attend this hearing and any other uh, feedback to the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Um, how do you determine how many of these cell sites to build and in what locations? Because I do know that Rancho Mirage is very spotty in certain areas, so we... Speaking for myself, I welcome this. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see another one, maybe over, you know, in certain areas, Victoria Falls. I've heard from constituents in Mission Hills Country Club, the service is very spotty. Mm -hmm. That is all uh, determined by AT&T and their research. research. Um, <clears throat> what they do is, through their research, they determine where they have these it's called significant gaps in service. Um, and you can see through the propagation maps that Joy presented that um, they found, found a certain region that was missing you know, service and oftentimes it's depending on the local population, the local measurements of usage in that area. So they, they find a significant gap in service and they, they do their best to uh, formulate a plan to fill that, fill that service. And they're constantly doing that. They're uh, throughout the communities and, and again, giving us opportunities as SmartLink Group, as a vendor to uh, work that out for them. Well, I'm sure it will be welcome with Cotino coming as well. So thank you very much for your time. Any other uh, council <coughs> comments? Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'll go ahead and, and uh, make the uh, motion that um, the City Council approve the filing of a notice of exemption based on environmental assessment case number EA22-0011 and pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act CEQA guidelines section 15303 new construction 
or conversion of small structures, and B, approve conditional use permit case number CUP22-0005, subject to the conditions of approval and based on the content and findings of the staff report. I'll, I'll second. second. Please vote. <clears throat> Motion carries 5-0. Okay, thank you. Now move on to item number 11, which is to consider the introduction of ordinance number next in order, first reading amending section 2.44.010 of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code to adjust the monthly compensation and benefits, uh, benefits for the um, city council and the mayor. And uh, it is being discussed by Isaiah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, so what you have before you is a uh, draft ordinance that would modify uh, city council member and mayor compensation. Uh, by way of background, uh, the last ordinance that was adopted on this topic uh, was from 2007. And so city council member compensation uh, has not uh, changed in many years. Uh, what this uh, proposed amendment would do, uh, and this was uh, reviewed and recommended by a council subcommittee, uh, which consisted of council member Meg Marker and Mayor Pro Tem Steve Downs. And what uh, the subcommittee is recommending are the five things identified in the staff report that I will summarize now. Uh, the first one would be to increase council member annual compensation from the current $31,110 a year to an even $35,000 a year. Uh, currently, uh, the mayor, uh, due to the additional duties that the mayor carries, uh, receives uh, a little extra in compensation, and so that is proposed to continue with this. And so uh, the mayor's annual compensation is currently $34,112, and the proposal would be to adjust that to $38,500. Uh, the proposal would be to extend the director's monthly uh, auto allowance of $500 per month to uh, all city council members. Item number four would be to uh, provide a monthly $500 in lieu stipend to any council member uh, who does uh, declines city medical coverage. Item number five is to provide a monthly $100 in lieu stipend to any council member that does not accept a city paid cell phone. Uh, with that, that concludes my staff report and I will turn this over to the city clerk. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. I did not receive any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? There are no comments. Okay, thank you. Any council comments? I do, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. So I, I'd like to thank uh, Council Member Marker for joining with me on the subcommittee to make these recommendations. We uh, spent uh, several meetings together to uh, uh, come up with uh, our recommendations, uh, after which we did uh, submit a recommendation to uh, the city manager and the city attorney. Uh, and it certainly it is the case that, uh, as the city manager mentioned, there hasn't been any adjustment since 2008. So we, we think the time is here. And uh, I appreciate uh, Council Member Marker's support. Thank you. Steve, I have one question. How were the amounts determined? Well, one thing we did was we took a look at uh, the COLA adjustments uh, over that 15-year period. And it certainly is the case that for most of that 15-year period, inflation was at a relatively low rate of uh, sometimes uh, one-ish percent or two-ish percent per year. Uh, it is the case that um, uh, inflation has increased dramatically over the last couple of years at six and seven percent for each of the last two years. But the point is that over that entire roughly 15-year cycle, uh, the COLA increase is about 40% uh, or so. So for example, uh, so those, uh, uh, those uh, residents of Rancho Mirage and this country who draw Social Security benefits, uh, their Social Security checks increased by 40% over that 15-year uh, period. This council has increased zero. Uh, and what this uh, proposal does is it suggests that the uh, council adjustment is uh, just at about a 13% level or only one-third of that COLA adjustment uh, that has happened over the past 15 years for every recipient, recipient of Social Security in this country. Okay, and when, if this is passed, when would the new rate go into effect? Excellent question. Uh, Mr. Uh, City Manager? I'll take that one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so since this is the introduction of the ordinance at the following meeting would be the adoption and then 30 days after that. Okay, that's when it actually goes into force. 
Yes. Uh, does it, does the term of the existing council have anything to do when the when they goes in? Nope. So it'll be there till you guys change it. Okay. Uh, Steve, one more question. Did you look at the other cities to see what their rates were for? Uh, yeah, and there, there's uh, there's a um, uh, sort of a. It's hard to figure out. You know, there's there's differences in su such dramatic differences in each city that um, um, it, it's hard to sort out. It certainly is the case that uh, uh, that in Palm Desert uh, they're I guess roughly equivalent, maybe a little lower than ours, with exception of uh, and in uh, Palm Springs the same, with the exception of the Palm Springs mayor, who will earn even after this is if we do, do approve this, the Palm Springs mayor will, mayor will continue to earn more than you do. <laughs> really? All yes. right. Yeah, but it's it's not far out of line with, okay. with the, the other cities in the desert. I didn't think so. Mr. Mayor, I do have those statistics that uh, Councilmember Downs had uh, uh, researched, and the state average is 36.9 thousand to 59.9 thousand. So we're still on the low end of that. And the, uh, in the state, it goes as high as over 200 thousand. So it's quite high. Um, and um, just to reiterate, the benefits package has not been addressed in over a decade, so it, it was definitely time to address this. And even more importantly, it's a small step in the right direction to help encourage individuals who are not retired or wealthy to seek this position in the future. Thank you, Meg. I think that's a great point. Thank you for mentioning that. So, yes, uh, service on this city council uh, is, um, it is the case that uh, you better have some alternate form of income. Uh, in order to serve, because uh, thirty some thousand dollars is, isn't going to do it. Uh, so yes, I agree that this is a way to encourage uh, others in the future to step up to service to this city. Now you tell us, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any Take uh, your day job. <laughs> yeah, right. Any further uh, council comments? Seeing none, can I have a motion, please? Meg, would you like to make the motion? Uh, I'd love to make the motion. I'd like to make a motion for the specific request that the City Council introduce ordinance number 2023, parenthesis next in order, first reading, amending section 2.44.010 of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code to adjust the monthly compensation and benefits for City Council members and mayor. And I'm happy to second that. Okay, there's a motion. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council, for doing such a good job on that. Okay, now we'll move on to item number 12, which is to consider the design of alternatives for the Frank Sinatra low water cr crossing. And uh, Brian, are you gonna do this? Yes, yes indeed. Um, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I am perceptive enough to know that I'm the last item on the agenda and that there's a bowl of M&Ms in the room to my left, so I'll make this quick. Uh, if I can get my presentation up. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit more background than I normally would to the benefit of our newer Council Members. Um, the, so we'll go through a bit of background, where we are with maintenance on the low water crossing. We'll spend a little time talking about a couple of design concepts that staff believes has merit if the Council wishes to uh, make some improvements to the Frank Sinatra uh, low water crossing. So where have we been on the bridge project? Um, staff will often refer to the bridge project maybe with a bit of disdain. Um, we don't do it on purpose, but for over a decade. I do. <laughs> yeah, city manager may. Um, over a decade, we had a very slow project, which was uh, riddled with, with challenges. And ultimately in 2021, given the totality of uh, everything going on, the city council designed or uh, decided to shelve the project. I wanna go through a little bit of the why. Um, largely, if I'm putting words in the hearing at the time, we're related to environmental aesthetic and noise concerns. What you're seeing are a, a batch of visual simulations based on all the federal uh, and CVWD requirements, the bridge grew, by, literally grew in size to the point where it was roughly 10 feet above the embankment on either side at the center of the bridge, bringing the road noise and visual domination of the bridge right into our residents' backyards. Again, um, at the time, the uh, construction estimates were reaching $60 million without any change orders that had been seen for uh, uh, field changes. 
um, and Caltrans had indicated to staff that we'd be uh, required to enter into an advanced funding agreement where the city council would be put in a position to have to front the cost of the bridge uh, with no real uh, concrete um, repayment schedule. At the time, the council decided again to shelve the project, but gave us two directives uh, at that meeting as well, which was, can we implement a better maintenance program and can we do a better job with a locally funded project? Now, when I say locally funded project, the city's portion of the $58 million uh, construction estimate was about $3 million. So the city would have had to kick in its own $3 million. And the, the question that I was getting is, if we took the same $3 million, could we do better? And that was sort of the genesis of, of where we went with this, um, the, the alternatives you'll see in a few minutes. Hey, Ryan, I don't mean to interrupt you. Do you have a picture of the grade control structure? Uh, I've hid those slides in the interest of time. Um, can we show what that looks like? Because I know that was a pretty yeah. big consideration for us. So uh, while Ryan's bringing that up, um, you know, that, that bridge project started out as a much lower bridge. And, you know, at one point we were probably in the $30 million range. And due to some change in CVWD requirements, that grew the height of the bridge. Um, and so that obviously swelled the cost. And then in, in addition, uh, CVWD um, uh, built a bridge down Valley in Indio, I believe. And um, one of their uh, pipes uh, that runs through the wash actually ended up getting exposed and breaking. And so they had to go back after the fact and put in this, uh, what they called a grade control structure. It's basically a huge concrete structure that protects their pipe uh, in the ground because when you elevate the bridge that changes water flow and it'll erode the ground that's there and expose these pipes. And so we were already scrambling for money uh, from Caltrans and what you saw was a huge pinch of funding in this highway bridge program. And so Caltrans started taking some pretty aggressive stances on costs. Um, and so when the topic of this grade control structure came up, um, Caltrans said, fine, we'll give you one adjustment in your budget, and then 100% of any overrun is on the city. And so uh, that was estimated around $5 million. Uh, but the scary part is, is when staff analyzed every bridge project in the valley uh, that had happened, we couldn't find one that didn't have a 20% overrun on cost because there's just so many unknowns. And then as we've seen, if we were in the middle of that project today, the increases just from COVID on materials would have shot this thing through the roof. And so obviously, you know, when we made those decisions, we weren't really anticipating the uh, increases in material that we all see today that has escalated the cost to do anything and everything. Uh, so, you know, looking back, you know, at, the dynamics that the council was facing, you know, I'm still very confident that this council came to the right decision to try to address this roadway locally instead of building this roadway. And, you know, there were just some really big aspects to this project, um, you know, some detrimental, uh, you know, view corridor uh, issues and noise. I mean, the, the intersection of um, uh, Frank Sinatra and Duvall, we were anticipating that to go up six to eight feet. And so that was the height of the wall of the community that's right there. So literally you would have been having motorists at the same level of a wall, the top of a wall. Uh, so there were a lot of things going on with this bridge. Uh, go ahead and show the picture of our grade control structure. Josh, give me back uh, that slide if you would. All right. So. The, the addition of the grade control structure really would have affected a bit, an additional 12 parcels. And uh, you, a grade control structure is essentially a speed bump for water within the wash. This is a picture of, I believe, the Indio um, grade control structure. And I think this is La Quinta. Yeah. Um, so, so this just shows you like the scope and magnitude of this thing that we would have had to done uh, do on the north side. 
And so to kind of look at this, I mean, you know, you see how big this is uh, compared to the, the workers that are there, but to really tell a city that, hey, we're gonna give you one budget adjustment and then the rest of the cost is gonna be on you. Uh, we probably, with you know the increases in pricing that we would have seen now in today's world, I mean, who knows what this yeah. thing would have done. So, you know, I, I think it's worth noting um, just at, since we're talking about this to refresh, why did we come to the decision uh, that we did? Uh, and I can still look back at a staff level and say, I truly believe from every side of this project, the council made the right decision. Um, you know, we have a roadway um, and, and Ryan probably has the numbers and we'll address it in the presentation, but it is rarely overflowing where we have to close the roadway. So we were looking at this massive project, this massive thing for a minor inconvenience within our community. Uh, so I just don't wanna forget that as we go through this. Thanks, Ryan. Yes, sir. All right, motoring on. Get back to where we were. Okay, so uh, city manager led in perfectly to the, what does the data tell us? Uh, well, the data tells us that we've closed that roadway seven to 10 times in approximately 20 years. Uh, the last closure was just this last month of February for a period of less than 12 hours. Prior to that was the Valentine's Day flood of 2019. <coughs> Prior to that, the next recorded closure we could find was all the way back to the picture you're seeing on the screen at 2010. Um, it happens very infrequently, and we believe that uh, with some of the maintenance efforts we're gonna show you, um, this, is ob this is obviously the number one culprit to the low water crossing having challenges, debris and sand that fills up within the 16 inlets. So if I can put uh, kind of again words in the mouth of the council at that time, which was, is it really worth spending 60 plus million dollars with all these unknowns for something that very rarely uh, overflows? And with some of the enhanced maintenance that we're asking for, can we even minimize those closures? And I think the answer will prove to be yes over the long run. So since that time, since uh, 2022, we've implemented annual cleaning for all 16 inlets, quarterly inspections, and we've de um, defined debris as a critical path item. This is a photo of the, what we, we refer to as the first annual all 16 inlet cleaning, uh, where we actually cleaned all 16 at one time. And uh, even though you can still see a little bit of landscape debris, this is the only time staff can actually find a recorded inspection where all 16 were cleaned and ready for uh, full use uh, at any one time. So we're feeling pretty good. And yesterday's performance with the massive amounts of water coming out of the mountains uh, was, uh, it handled it great. We got up to about the top of the inlets and we fared just fine. So again, getting back to that second question from the, the December 21 um, meeting was, can we do a better job with a locally focused project on vehicular safety, pedestrian safety and connectivity and our ability to maintain the structure? And generally when I'm talking about vehicular safety, we're talking about some barrier between the edge of the roadway um, and vehicles. Uh, what you're seeing a picture of here is a concrete vehicular rated barrier. Um, talking connectivity, we do zoom out and kind of look at the area. Anytime we're looking at a sidewalk connection or how do we connect here to here, we do kind of take a step uh, from a higher level and a connection, pedestrian connection along Frank Sinatra really does help the entire Peterson um, and adjoining neighborhoods find ways to Wolfson Park, the Butler Abrams Trail, City Hall hiking trails. So it does really help with the global um, uh, pedestrian and cyclist connections. And again, when I'm talking about ped and, and bike safety, we're generally talking about some way to keep those users um, away from vehicular traffic um, and a little bit uh, safer way. Okay. Uh, let's get into a little bit of the, the design alternatives, but before I go into specific design alternatives, the blue line indicated in the cloud that I just put up is one area that we're gonna have to deal with uh, regardless of any uh, alternative the council may want to explore. Up on the screen right here is a, what many of us can visualize as a grassy uh, embankment that's just east of Duke's convenience store. And as I'll show in the, my final slide, when it comes to the budget, this is an expensive little connection of sidewalk because we'd have to relocate some public utilities and create a retaining wall to be able to install the sidewalk. Um, it is not a cheap endeavor, but it is 
uh, worth the pedestrian. If the council defines it as important, this would be a part of any project we take on. So into the specific alternatives, as I briefly touched on in my staff report, what you're looking at here is a roadway section. Your cars would be driving up on top here. Your inlets are shown through this dashed line. And alternative one is just simply taking that southern side of uh, the low water crossing and extending it in an amount that gives us plenty of room to create that dedicated ped path. It gives you a concrete or steel barrier from vehicles to sidewalk, and it gives you another barrier from um, the edge of the low water crossing to the ped path. The number one question I get when I present this to staff is, could we widen it enough to create this on both sides of the street? And the answer is certainly maybe, and it's one of the questions we'll be exploring uh, with any engineering firm that we do, uh, if we decide to proceed. So what you're seeing here is um, both alternatives two and three shown on the same uh, slide, but I'll focus first on the blue line, which is alternative two, which is installing an at-grade path on the south side of the wash, similar to what we have with the Butler Abrams Trail. Um, one of the areas that I'll again show when we look at uh, estimated project costs is to do this correctly, we'd have to install a ADA approvable pathway down off of the low water crossing, which makes this a little bit more expensive and challenging than you may perceive. And these are extremely susceptible to um, damage and uh, maintenance during um, high flow times. Like in the last day, this path just wouldn't even be usable. And alternative three, which you're seeing in the green line, is an elevated, separated from the roadway, um, pre-manufactured bridge structure that's rated to the 10-year storm. You might recognize some structures like this from adjacent uh, jurisdictions. This one that you're seeing is on, Palm, uh, is on 111 in Palm Springs. And while they, they can be a good um, addition, they're extremely expensive, uh, not only for construction, uh, but over the long run, the maintenance on them is challenging. Okay, so uh, Isaiah and I also thought it was important to report uh, to the council that we did uh, evaluate a couple of other ideas that were not carried forward. Um, some folks will just say, narrow up traffic lanes, that gives you plenty. Um, the actual width of this low water crossing is actually pretty narrow at 56 feet. So narrowing up or skinning up the travel lanes just isn't a good idea. It doesn't really benefit anybody well. It, it can work, but it only leaves you with a five foot sidewalk on one side. It just didn't seem like it was a good alternative given the, um, how skinny that roadway is. Uh, others might just suggest that, you know, hey, remove a traffic lane in either direction. And again, um, that's easy to say, but it's harder to implement, especially as we get closer to 111 with um, motorists turning both directions and going in and out of our residential communities. It creates confusion to the motorist. Confusion leads to um, accidents and other strange oddities. Uh, and lastly, you'll see other communities that will use these pedestrian overcrossings, none of which we thought f fit in with the context of uh, this. Mina was pulling for that one, yeah, but we yeah, had to tell her, yeah, no way. Yeah, our planning team was all over this one. Uh, that one made it about five seconds into our uh, presentation before we said next. <laughs> all right, to the numbers. We're at a very preliminary state, but our engineering team was able to pull together some uh, very uh, preliminary cost estimates. And again, that retaining wall and sidewalk section from Dukes eastward uh, is approximately $650,000 endeavor. Coupled with all the additional costs, and we're going to work from alternative three uh, back to one, uh, you can see the raised bridge, while it's an interesting option, is extremely expensive at uh, $9 million. Staff was not supportive of moving that direction. The at-grade path seems um, you think it might be cheaper than that, but it really isn't once you consider all of the uh, ADA improvements needed to get you down into the pathway and given the maintenance challenges, we didn't think that that was the right way to go. Where we thought the sweet spot was, was the extension of the existing low water crossing at an estimated $2 million project as where we should be uh, putting our efforts if the council wishes to proceed with a project at the low water crossing. So it's, interest, it's important to note that all of these are subject to CVD, CVWD's jurisdiction. And uh, as listed in the staff report, we are asking for 
direction to proceed with feasibility analysis. And what that means is we have to prepare uh, a little bit deeper documents um, to go have some real conversations with the stakeholders, and we'd have to engage a uh, engineering team to put that together. So if the council wishes to proceed, give us that direction, and you'll start seeing these dollars show up in your future year's budgets. Um, that does conclude my staff report. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, comments from the audience? Thank you. I do not have any speaker cards. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this? Okay, come on up. There's somebody coming up. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, on your um, numbers, on your on your estimates of um, uh, uh, cost estimates, do you do you use labor wages or or rather union wages or non-union wages? So we're required to use uh, prevailing wages. Uh, as set by the Department of Industrial Relations. It's not quite union wages, but it's, it's a similar calculation. Uh, I'll accept that, but, in, but, in, <clears throat> but it's not very accurate. Thank you. Ryan, what's the situation as far as CVWD cost and the bills for us to build this? I mean, you, every time we do something with them, the cost goes up, right? You know, we don't know. We, we, know. we certainly don't know. Um, we don't know what we, but I, I certainly need to go to yeah. them and have some of those conversations, and I just don't know what we're going to face. So, so, you know, part of the purpose of today is uh, we wanted to update the council and uh, present these alternatives and say, are we on the right track, right? There's, there's probably more questions than answers at this point, so... Uh, we might not even be able to accomplish what we're proposing today because we haven't gone as far as to say, you know, let's go meet with stakeholders. Uh, really, the purpose of the, today was, you know, to hear from the council, you know, based on, you know, the history of where we've been, are we on the right path and do you want us to keep working towards that and then bring back information as, as we work with them? I certainly think we need more information, but... Uh... Ted? Well, I think that's the point, that uh, <clears throat> all we're doing at this point is um, giving staff uh, the direction to proceed with a feasibility analysis. Um, and I don't think any of us are kidding ourselves uh, to think that uh, by the time the dust settles, this will not be a more expensive project. Amen. Uh, uh, CV CVWD has... Um, uh, a knack for increasing costs significantly. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to make a, a motion that the City Council direct staff to proceed with the feasibility analysis of Alternative 1. I'll second that. There's a motion. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, I believe that is the uh, final item for today. So we'll go to closed session with Steve Quintanay, our city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I'd like to comment that I find it interesting that Councilmember Downs claims you only turn 50 once because I'm proof that you can turn 30 twice. <laughs> <laughs> so the council at this point is going to recess in a closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D1 regarding the following existing litigation matters. Vacation rental owners and neighbors of Rancho Mirage et al. versus City of Rancho Mirage. Vac vacation rental owners and neighbors of Rancho Mirage versus City of Rancho Mirage. Wendy Hope Heckman versus City of Rancho Mirage. The fourth case is, um, we, the name is unspecified since disclosure would jeopardize pending settlement negotiations. And finally, the council will confer with legal counsel um, pursuant to Government Code Section 549.9D4 regarding one potential initiation of litigation. That's it, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Thank you. We convene an open session.
anything reportable? I guess we do. I, I think it's fine. So the city council took no reportable action in closed session. Right. You got to adjourn the meeting. You got to adjourn. Adjourned.